Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about our default assumptions for learning new words, whether as kids, in a classroom, or while traveling. But first, we have new merch. We have three new designs for merch. First off, we have some t-shirts and stickers and badges, buttons, pins, whatever you call them, that say, ask me about linguistics. They look kind of like one of those classic red Hello My Name Is stickers, only with linguistics instead of your name. For those times when you're maybe at a conference or an event or just going about your life and you want people to know that they could skip the small talk with you and talk directly about linguistics with you. We also have t-shirts that say, more people have read the text on this shirt than I have, which is not untrue. <laughs> This is a classic kind of sentence in linguistics, more commonly found as more people have been to Russia than I have, but that was less funny and self-referential on a t-shirt. And these are called the comparative illusion, which is when the first time you read that sentence with a comparative in it, more people have been to Russia than I have, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Wait, hang on. What does that even mean? And that's the illusion part that the illusion is that it makes sense. And if you think about it longer, then it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And if you wear a shirt that says this, or a hat, or you carry around a mug or a sticker or a tote bag that says these things with, of course, like the word shirt swapped out for the relevant object, because we mm -hmm. know how to do that, <laughs> then people might do a double take when they see it. And you can confuse people, which sounds fun. This t-shirt is available in an old school typewriter looking font and all of our shirt options are there on Redbubble with a range of different cuts and colors. We have relaxed, fitted, classic t-shirts as well as hoodies, zip hoodies and tank tops. And we have a secret third design which we will be talking about later this episode. Dun dun dun. Mmm, suspense and mysteries. Our most recent bonus episode is about the word do in English and why it's weird compared to basically every other language, and how this only started happening in the past few hundred years. To listen to this and many other bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Plus, patrons got to find out about this new merch a few weeks ago. So if you become a patron now, you'll be the first to find out about future new merch and other behind-the-scenes updates, and you get to hang out on the Lingthusiasm Discord server to chat with other linguistics fans, plus, of course, getting a whole bunch of bonus episodes and just helping us continue making the show for you. I want you to imagine you're visiting a place where you don't speak the language and you're standing in a field with one of your new friends. It's a lovely day, you're enjoying the scenery, and a rabbit scurries by, and that person you're standing with says, Gavagai. What do you think they are referring to? So I want to say that they're talking about the rabbit. This is a word that means rabbit, probably, in whatever that language is. Possibly. But in principle, it could mean a lot of other things as well. Like, it could mean scurrying or creature or animal or, as the philosopher V.W. O'Quine said, low, undetached rabbit parts. <laughs> Which is just a very bizarre mental image. This is indeed a classic linguistic thought experiment from the philosopher V.W. O'Quine. It's also found in philosophy of language as well as linguistics. So the philosophers sometimes also talk about this anecdote from a more philosophical perspective. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's exciting to me about it as a linguist is that it's this pretty good approximation and distillation of the kind of challenge that you have when you're trying to figure out some words in another language and you don't have someone or a book that can do some translation for you. So you're just like, well, here's this word that's been said in this context. Do I, what do I think it refers to? I also appreciate how this one little thought experiment, interactional moment set Quine on a philosophical train of thought that took up an entire book. Quine's 1960 book, Word and Object, takes this thought experiment as its starting point to tease apart a lot of the issues around how we make and share meaning, especially across languages. So he's got like 200 plus pages of pretty dense philosophical 
argument around this idea of how we make and share meaning and that this initial moment we have some biases as humans towards what we think people are likely to be referring to when they give us a word out of the blue like that. And some systematic ways we can go about confirming whether our hypotheses and biases are correct there. Right. And like, we might be wrong, right? <laughs> this could be a particular species of rabbit. This could be, you know, a young rabbit, an old rabbit, a male rabbit, a female rabbit. There could be more that we're not aware of in this particular context, but it gives us this start and that we tend to assume that words refer to whole objects in this particular way and not just like the rabbit's ears. The Gavagai thought experiment has kind of almost gone from thought experiment to fairy tale in linguistics and philosophy. I feel like it's a story that we tell and share and it's always Gavagai, it's always a rabbit. It's kind of become immortalized in this way. Gavagai is such a catchy name. Like, he's just a little guy. It's this cute rabbit. (laughs) (laughs) Quine did some great branding. So we decided to make some merch that has this great sort of woodcut type sketch of a rabbit with the caption Gavagai and low and undetached rabbit parts from our artist Lucy Maddox. Fun fact about the quote that we put on the t-shirt, low and undetached rabbit part, is something that I always was told as part of the story of Gavagai. Me too, yeah. Is that not what he said? (laughs) Going back to word and object, he never quite used that combination of words in reference to Gavagai. And he did say, you know, low a rabbit, or it could mean undetached rabbit part, but he never used this particular combination of words. And so it's kind of become part of us perpetuating the folk story rather than just us directly and specifically referencing Quine. I think because low has this old timey feeling to it, and also that undetached rabbit part is such a like weird and memorable concept, that yeah, I guess people must have just shoved them together in memory because I could have sworn that's how I was taught it. Fascinating. So this is our tribute to the folktale aspect of Gavagai, and also because it's very catchy and it's a, fu- it's a fun little name. And so this is our third item of merch that we have available now. It's incredibly cute. We have it in a range of colors. It looks amazing on different colored t-shirts, and we're so happy to get to continue the story of Gavagai. It's got this whole almost sort of retrofuturism vaporwave aesthetic if you combine the colors in particular combinations, or you can get this very kind of traditional woodblock look depending on which color combination you pick. So I think it's it's really fun as both historical and also modern. I mean, also, I think there's always been something charming about it being a rabbit. And there are other linguistic experiments that also involve rabbits. We've talked about how Bill Above, who's a famous sociolinguist, did a rabbit experiment with some children where they were feeling shy, and so he had them talk to a rabbit instead of to an experimenter. So there's a nice tradition of rabbits in linguistics. And Gavagai also is also available on uh, children's t-shirts and onesies if you have a kid who you want to dress up as a famous linguistic thought experiment. Speaking of kids, I feel like a kid would be very chill with just having a rabbit pointed out with Gavagai because they have to make sense of the world as they're living in it. And Children tend to have this assumption that you are referring to a whole object. You're not just referring to the ears of the rabbit, but you're referring to the whole rabbit at once. Yeah. So this is called the whole object assumption, and it comes up quite a bit when people are analyzing child language acquisition. How do kids learn so many words so fast? And part of it is because they are often making these sorts of assumptions, which are sometimes wrong about the generalizability of the words that they're learning. And they're often at this sort of particular object level of like rabbit or truck rather than like wheels or ears or yellow or fuzzy or animal, which are both more or less levels of granularity as applied to the objects. They're often doing it sort of this object level. I feel like language learning apps and textbooks also sit at the kind of whole object bias level as well. They also make use of this. Yeah, I'm taking an ASL class at the moment. And the textbook that we're using, which I'm told is a very popular textbook called Signing Naturally. And it does this thing where it's trying not to imply that ASL signs have these direct translations into English words. It's trying to get you to consider them as meanings themselves that may not correspond directly with other languages because it's its own language. 
And so sometimes it'll give several possible English translations, English words or phrases to translate a sign. And sometimes wherever it's possible, it'll give pictures instead. But so for example, for clothing, you'll have a drawing of a dress and then but it's a drawing of like a particular dress that has like a color and a style to it. And then you have to make this generalization in your head of that's a dress. And I'm probably meant to assume that this is the sign for the concept of dresses in general and not be overly narrow on specific style of dress or overly general on this could be any article of clothing. Or they'll give like a photo of a dog and you're supposed to conclude, okay, this is a sign for a dog in general, not Fido the dog or golden retriever or mammal. <laughs> it would be very impressive and counterintuitive if you learnt the word for Dalmatian before dog. <laughs> or they just went through and being like, the only dog you'll ever need to refer to is Snuggles here. Dalmatians apparently are often deaf, so there's a whole section about Dalmatians in this textbook. Amazing. <laughs> but this is also based on your level of awareness of the kind of granularity that humans tend to communicate at with pictures. And this is not uncommon for language textbooks and apps that they're trying to avoid translation, which is all very well, but instead they're doing this baked in level of assumption about what this one picture corresponds to, which is inevitably less general than a word, because like the word dog refers to the whole class of dogs, but a picture of a dog necessarily has to be a specific dog that looks like a particular way. I mean, alternatively, they could give you a whole bunch of different pictures of different kinds of dogs and refer to them all as dog, which is more like what a baby has because they're learning the language in the whole world. But in practice, it does work pretty effectively to rely on this type of assumption. And this thought experiment can tell us about why. I also like that Quine chose a kind of nice, almost textbook animal. Like it's a small, independent if you don't have rabbits in your ecosystem, you probably have some other small, scurrying, possibly mammalian creature that you can substitute in. It's like a nice, in the real world object. But, you know, not all of us walk in and start looking at random animals passing by. So if you're starting to do, say, linguistic fieldwork in a language you don't know much about, the question is kind of always, where do you start? When I have taken classes where, you know, where you bring in a speaker of a language that nobody in the class knows anything about, who's often like a grad student in a different department at the university who's like, yeah, I'll do this side job, sounds fun. <laughs> like we've often started with like greetings, which is sort of polite, and then sometimes with like some verbs. But we have this shared classroom context, which is also kind of artificial. And sometimes you just want to get a sense of the kind of way that words sound and the way the language feels. And one really common way of getting a sense of the language is to collect a word list. So using a shared language and asking someone to translate common words into their language. And the word list thing is such an interesting puzzle because if you're thinking about, okay, I want to compare like several different languages or compare this language to other languages that have had people do documentation on them, you want to try to collect a very similar word list across different languages. Mm -hmm. And yet also languages arise in different cultural contexts and they say different things and what one language might have words for might not be the same as another language. So how do you pick a set of words that languages are really likely to have in common? The good news is you don't have to do that work. <laughs> <laughs> There is a list, and much like Gavagai is a meme, I feel like the Swadesh list is a bit of a linguistics meme in the language documentation world. This is a kind of standardized list of common vocabulary that people will often collect for a language that they're documenting. So this is a list that's named after a linguist named Morris Swadesh. By the way, it's not – when I first encountered it as a grad student, I was like, ooh, what does it mean to Swadesh something? And it just means to name it after a guy. Yeah, I thought it was an acronym. And yeah. I was like, yeah, W probably stands for words. And <laughs> it just kind of didn't flesh it out. We could retronym it. The thing about Swadesh lists is reading through them is kind of this fun experience. So – there's many Swadesh lists because people can't agree, obviously, on like what the most basic words should be or how many of them there are. I think Swadesh's first list was like 100 words. And then there's like a 207 word version. Why the seven? 
That's what I've always wanted to know. So there was this 100-word list, mm-hmm. and then someone else came up with this 200-word list. Yeah. But the 100-word list actually had seven words that were on it that weren't on the 200-word list. So they got kind of merged together with these extra seven words. I've always wondered where those seven words came from because it made it sound very intentional and scientific. Absolutely not. But just to be very clear, the Swadesh list is like – Morris Swadesh, who was a brilliant linguist, but he kind of came up with this list based on his intuitions about what were li- words that were likely to be existent in as many of the world's languages as possible while also being kind of independent of culture, cultural influences. So I think we should just read this, at least the 100 word list, which is shorter. Oh, yeah. People can click through to the, <laughs> the longer 207 word list if you want to see what the expansion pack looks like. But let's start with our like 100 starter Pokemon Swadish list. Sure. And maybe give a bit of commentary about the, the list. And they're very handily grouped. Uh, at least this list that I have is grouped into sort of topics. Mm-hmm. So we have words related to like the here and now. I... You, we, this, that, who, what. Well, this is the classic order that I have done Swadesh lists in. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's like there's some versions of the list that split you into you singular and you plural because, of course, English merges those, but most languages don't. Mm-hmm. And then we have words related to like quantity or amount. Not, all, many, one, two, big, long, small. And then a few words related to people. Woman. Man, person. And animals. Fish, bird, dog, louse. The four animals. I mean, the absolute irritation of living your life with lice. I can see how he would have put this on the list. Lice are truly ubiquitous part of the human experience, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. And then we have a section of words that are related to, like, parts of plants. Tree, seed, leaf, root, bark, And there's a clarification, this is bark of tree, not bark of dog. But also because the next word on the list is skin. Yeah. As in brackets person, because tree bark and human skin can actually be the same word in a lot of languages. So they just want to really clarify. Yeah. So then there's a bunch of words related to like internal parts of the body. Skin, flesh, blood, bone, grease, egg, horn. I think we're moving beyond humans here. Yeah. Tail, (laughs) feather. Oh, we're back to humans. We've got hair, head, ear, eye, nose, mouth, tooth, tongue, claw, foot, knee, hand, belly, neck, breasts, heart, liver. We've gone all the way through the body. Yeah. So a sort of interesting assortment of words related to body parts, both of humans, animals, and also plants like seed and leaf. And then we've got a bunch of verbs related to actions the human body can do. Drink, eat, bite. See, hear, know, sleep, die, kill, swim, fly, walk, come, lie, sit, stand, give, say. And then we've got some words related to natural weathery phenomena. Sun, moon, star, water, rain, stone, sand. That's beyond weather. We're just into nature now. Earth, soil specifically, cloud, not fog, it says. Smoke. (laughs) Yeah, you can get a sense of like human activities. Fire, ashes, burn, path. And also mountain in this sort of set. It's it's hard to like break them up into groups because they sort of Mm. follow this trajectory of like burn, path, mountain. Like I can write this short story. Again, very clearly not hill. Yeah. Well, and also that like English alphabetical order is almost guaranteed not to be alphabetical order in any other language, right? So this is not going to help at all. Yeah. And it is actually a good flow. And it's really nice to have them semantic and not like in some kind of random alphabetical order when you're talking to people because – they're going to be thinking of, you know, smoke more easily if you've just said cloud than if you've just said small. <laughs> There's a selection of colors. Our basic color list has five colors. Red, green, yellow, white, black. Yeah, that's a choice. <laughs> and then after black comes night, which again, semantically yes, related. Also true. And then we've got a few sort of adjective things. Hot, cold, both of those specifically of weather. Full, new, good, round dry. And then just finally all by itself with no real semantic categoryness. Name. Which, you know, is an important word, but yeah. Swadesh is there with 99 words and he's just like, oh, that's a really good one. 
go get that in. <laughs> yeah. So these are concepts that he thinks are ubiquitous to the human experience, which, you know, may or may not be the case. Like, not everyone lives in places where there are mountains or where there's enough, like, water to swim in. Like, there certainly are some aspects of these that you could definitely dispute. But, you know, it's kind of fun to be like, yeah, we all have the moon. Like, that's neat. Yep. And it's always been a sense of, like, this is just a list, not because it is necessarily objectively the most universalizable set of words, but it's just like, look, I think this is a pretty good list. And everyone's been like, it's, it's pretty good. It does the job. We get a hundred words. We can start comparing languages. I've definitely done this with a whole bunch of different dialects. And as I'm going through being like, oh, all well, these people have kept a final K on these words. That's interesting. Like it, it does the job and we're all pretty realistic about that. <laughs> and there are lots of people who have proposed sort of v- alternate versions of Swadesh list, including Swadesh himself, who proposed like several different versions. Yeah. And because there's this sense that this is an evolving thing. But like names for parts of the body, that makes sense. The longer list, we're not going to read all 207, but it has more verbs on it. It has more kinship terms. So it's got, you know, mother, father, mm-hmm. wife, husband, some of these kinship terms. And it's just got like more of everything. So you can kind of expand it in various directions. And something that I think is really neat about the Swadesh list is because they're this thing that has this cultural history of being collected in a lot of different places, you can try to do these sort of very large scale analyses comparing a whole bunch of languages, because for many of them, something like a Swadesh list exists, whereas a list that had a whole bunch of more culturally specific items on there. So there's not a lot of food on this list other than like fish. Yes. And like liver, leaf and bark. (laughs) Because with food, you could run into this problem of like, well, okay, in this part of the world, we want to have rice on the list. And this part of the world, we want to have corn on the list. And this part of the world, we want to have potatoes or want to have wheat or want to have something else for your staple starch, which is really culturally important, but changes depending on where you are. In the corner of the world that I work in with the Sino-Tibetan language family, there is actually a area-specific set of word lists that are much more culturally specific and were created by a team looking at specifically the relationship between all the languages in this big family. And you do get a lot more words that if I were just translating them into English would be rice, but you have like rice as it is growing on the rice plant. And then you have unhusked rice and then you have husked uncooked rice and cooked rice. All of these things we just translate as rice, as like non-agricultural English speakers who eat rice as one of many different staple carbs, but much more of that cultural specificity that Swadesh was actually trying to avoid with this list of 100 words. But I have so many different words for ways that I can eat potatoes. (laughs) True. (laughs) Or bread. They could be french fries. They could be chips. They could be mashed and (laughs) baked. And it could be a baguette or a loaf. But yeah, there are different levels of cultural specificity. I also find it interesting that there was another linguist who came up with a Swadesh list for signed languages. Because if you do this traditional Swadesh list for a sign language, a lot of sign languages use fairly similar ways of expressing pronouns like I and you yep. because you can use pointing and body parts because you can point to the body part or otherwise indicate it in some way. You've got them right there. And so if you compare sign languages and your list contains like one third body parts, which this 100 Swadesh list is like at least a quarter body parts, you might be like, yeah, they're all totally so related because they all indicate the eye by pointing to the eye. (laughs) And so he was like, look, we've got to have a list that's not like that for comparing sign languages that has other words on it because... Otherwise, you're going to overestimate this relationship. So the first 10 words on James Woodward's sign language Swadesh list, they are in alphabetical order, which, you know, gives you at least a sense of like the the spread are all animal, bad, because, bird, black, blood, child, count, and day. Again, fairly cross-cultural concepts, but not as many body parts. That's cool. I didn't know there was a sign-specific list. Yeah, it's neat to think about the different types of relationships that a Swadesh list can be trying to express. One of the things I always find interesting about the Gavagai thought experiment is that there is this assumption that you're talking about 
the rabbit and not the moving. Mm. Because some languages will place more emphasis on the movement of animals as a way of describing and distinguishing them. Um, and you see in the Swadesh list as well, you know, we, we have some basic noun things and we have some basic verb action items in that list. And I have occasionally had to double check and act out some of those <laughs> actions to make sure we're definitely talking about the same thing. But one example of specific verbs that I often think about is Nick Evans' description of verbs for different kinds of macropods hopping in the Gunwingu language, which is spoken in the top end in Arnhem Land in Australia. So macropods are things like kangaroos and wallabies? Things like kangaroos and wallabies, and there's a whole world of different hopping creatures of this type in Australia. So you also have wallaroos and paddy melons in different parts of Australia and many different types of kangaroo. So this is really an area about which I know very little about the flora and fauna. Yeah, in the way that like in doing the Gavagai merch, I learned there are so many more different types of rabbit than the like pet bunnies and the random wild rabbits that were released into Australia by white settlers. So, <laughs> Okay, I'm learning some things about animals. And so there are different verbs to describe the hopping of. So in English, if I was talking about kangaroos and I guess wallabies and wallaroos sort of look like smaller versions of them. Yeah. And so I would just say the kangaroo hops and like the wallaby hops, the wallaroo hops. I would describe these animals differently using the name of the animal and describe their action as being essentially the same thing. Uh, yeah. Whereas in Gunwingu, you have a different verb for if you're talking about the hopping of a black wallaroo compared to an agile wallaby. And for the antelopine wallaby, you have different verbs depending on whether it's a male or a female hopping. Wow. And what's really nifty about this is that sometimes it is actually easier to identify the difference between some of these macropods based on the way that they hop rather than just looking at the animal itself. Oh, I guess because if most of the time you're when you're seeing them, they're like in motion, then it's really the movement that's telling you like what the different species is. And so – you have all of this cultural knowledge. Like, when you start unpacking what Gavagai means, who knows what kind of cultural knowledge might be tied up in that. You know, before we were just talking about, like, whether it's male or female, but there could be all kinds of things about, like, the particular breed of rabbit you can tell from the way that it scurries. Or it could be one of those snowshoe hares in North America. You mean the ones that change colour and turn white in the winter to match the snow and then brown in the summer to match the ground? Yeah, it could be that you see a rabbit with your friend and then six months later they say Gavagai again and you're like, oh, so brown and white rabbits. But no, it's only the snowshoe hair specifically that is brown at one time of year and white at the other time of year. Yeah, you are never going to get that kind of knowledge from just your first interaction with a language and the, its speakers and the world in which they live. Uh, that's going to come with, with way more engagement. And I think the the other nice thing about the the Gavagai story is it reminds us to be sort of curious and humble about our first attempt at figuring out the meaning of a word and realizing that there can always be more going on with the word than is apparent at first glance. Yeah, and that just because you don't immediately have like some scientific classification for what you're doing doesn't mean that it doesn't have knowledge and value included in that. This is one of the things that gets me about, you know, these things that go around on social media occasionally where like, there's no such thing as a fish. Like fish is not a scientific category. It is a category of humans who went like, yeah, a little swimmy thing, that's a fish. Yeah. In the way that people get very exercised about whether something is a fruit or not. Yeah. And there are so many more items in the world for which this is true. Once you start digging into it. So there's this Tumblr thread about how not only is fish not real, but also trees. Like, there is a convergent evolution of, like, make the plant tall. <laughs> I do like the person that it centers with, like, oh, if you thought fish were a problem, have I got news for you about lizards? And you're just like, oh, this is actually a thing for everything. And, like, 
trees aren't a whole coherent like taxonomic strategy. It's just that being a tree is like becoming a crab. It's like when a plant wants to become tall, it trees itself and is it's not like there's like like palm trees and evergreen trees are not related to each other. There's a whole bunch of bushes and other plants in between them that are more closely related. Yeah. I think this is why lexicography and making dictionaries and writing dictionary entries and making sense of the relationships between different meanings of a word is as much an art as a science. Like you can have all these objective facts about rabbits or about lizards or about fish but at the end of the day it's like how are people actually using this word you have to pay attention to that (laughs) and the fun part is that like linguists similarly don't have a coherent like taxonomic definition for what a word is (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's true because there are folk meanings that things have where you're like well i know what a tree is good enough which is it's a tall plant that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Or I know what a word is good enough. I've said some, but the sort of borderline of like is can't one word or two words or like is 21 one word or two words. This gets a little bit messier and it's actually okay because actually all the words work like this where you have like some examples that are really clear cut and some examples that are fuzzier and we're just really good at dealing with these sort of fuzzy examples. I really love, you know, going from that first Gavagai moment to spending a lot of time with a language as a learner or as someone describing the language and then coming back to those early notes that you make and going, ah, <laughs> I was so wrong. <laughs> or I just happened to be talking to someone who used like the more formal word for hand And everyone else just uses this other word or, oh, it turned out I thought that was like the specific word for this thing, but it's just a more general word. Or that's like a word that people say like thingamajig when they don't actually know Mm -hmm. what it's called. And I thought it was like the actual word for this thing. Yes. It turns out that I thought we were both talking about the verb to flap your wings and fly, but they just gave me the word for the little insect. That was a bit embarrassing. I'm glad we fixed that one up. (laughs) (laughs) And that's one of the challenges with trying to learn a language by translating a list is that it can give you this sort of one foothold into here are some things maybe that are going on, but also you don't get that sort of full nuanced take and you're reliant on nuances in the translating language, which like as in the case of English where we don't necessarily make a distinction between a singular you and a plural you may introduce some really weird complications when you're going into another language. Well, ignoring the word nuance there. I think if we're not going to use a word list, we should go fully and completely and 100% in the opposite direction. And that opposite direction is monolingual, only using the language of the people that you're working with, full monolingual language learning, language documentation. So I have never done this because I've only ever been in environments where people were multilingual. But I have seen a demonstration of this at a linguistics conference. Mm -hmm. And the demonstration was also pretty artificial. So they like got a linguist who was used to doing this and they got somebody who worked at the university in like some other job probably who also spoke a language that the linguist didn't speak. And they said, okay, like you and I were doing this, Lauren, we definitely share English in common, but we could probably do a monolingual fieldwork situation where you spoke Nepali the whole time. And I spoke, you don't speak much French, right? I could just speak French. I could I could learn, I could do field work on you as a French speaker, and I could do it through Nepali so that everyone in the audience had the experience of not sharing a language with either of us. Right. I probably wouldn't be a great choice for this because you probably want somebody who's like moved here from France. But you know, you could do this you could if you and a friend have different languages, you can try this for yourself where you don't speak any of the languages you have in common and you see what you can figure out about each other. And One of the things that I noticed about this demonstration is that it focused very much on the sort of physical at the beginning. So I don't know how much the speaker was briefed ahead of time, but the linguist had some objects like some sticks and some rocks, (laughs) because I think they were very much trying to simulate this, like, you've shown up somewhere and you don't know what objects you're going to have in common sort of culturally, so you've got to rely on things in nature. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the linguist did like, okay, if I hold up one stick – 
what are you going to say? If I hold up two sticks, what are you going to say? If I hold up three sticks? Oh, I reckon the difference between those might give us some early numbers and or plural marking. Exactly. And then if I hold up this stick and I drop it, maybe I'm going to get a verb. It might not be a verb, right? But if I have stick and a verb, suddenly I can start figuring out the order that words go in in a sentence. Right. And if I have like, then if I take two sticks and I drop them, do I get a different verb? If I take a rock and two rocks, and then I drop the rocks. And so you can start getting some things that you can compare. And you're still dealing with very sort of physical, tangible objects. But yeah, the idea is that maybe you can figure out at least some things about the language. Does What does it do for, for number? What does it do for nouns and verbs? And then slowly build up into like acting out more and more complicated scenarios. You know, you have the linguist like running around on the stage <laughs> and being like, okay, well, <laughs> maybe you'll give me a word that means running, or maybe it'll be walking, or maybe it'll mean movement. You're not quite sure, but you can try to get to this sort of position. I do think Quine would be super happy to know, though, that like we're doing everything really, we're really thinking about words, aren't we? Like we're collecting words for some items and some actions, and we're really trying to figure out how to mediate our experience of those things through words. Yeah. And like, I was wondering when I was sitting there watching one, like how much of this is the participant getting briefed ahead of time because like I wouldn't want to do a demo on a stage unless someone told me like what they were trying to do. Yes. There were like a hundred people watching <laughs> this. A and how much of these assumptions around like if I hold something up, am I asking for the name of it? Or like what what am I asking for? And so I was having my own sort of indeterminacy of translation moment of like how much can we rely on what I'm assuming the translation is going to be actually is what the person's saying. And like, if you were doing fieldwork on French on me, and you have a stick and you drop it, the word for French doesn't have one single word that means drop. Right. It has a two word fixed expression that means basically let fall, which is used in context where I would use drop. But like, you would have no way of knowing that this is actually a two word phrase, no. that this is just what people say in this context. I might come back later when I've accidentally fallen over. And you're like, are you okay? You fell. And I'll be like, aha, uh -huh, I can put these two ideas together. But again, I think this is the like difference between going from knowing nothing about a language to at the end of an hour, you can figure out a lot, but that's still just a fraction. And then you can spend the, the rest, rest of your life figuring out. Yeah. What things. <laughs> yeah. And I do love like Quine spends multiple pages early on in his Gavagai thought experiment being like, okay, once you've got Gavagai, guy and you're pretty sure it's rabbit, but you're going to spend like all this time figuring out if it's rabbit or not. And like, you're probably going to want to learn pretty early on words for like, yes, or affirmation or agreement or no. But like, how are you going to know what they are? You can't rely on gestures. I do appreciate that Quine was aware that like a head shake and a head nod can mean very different things in different cultures. Absolutely. They can mean different things in different cultures. <laughs> you can't get ahead of yourself on any of this. You have to collaboratively build this dynamic relationship with people while you're figuring things out. And I think that's the thing about the sort of artificiality of the monolingual fieldwork being like a demonstration that happened at a mm -hmm. conference and not something that I really know a lot of people who've done. Yeah. And that's that it sort of, it highlights this in many ways, very underprepared linguist who is not very community-centric, right? <laughs> but I did get some sticks before I got here. <laughs> I just picked up this stick. I didn't do any attempt to like try to find a speaker who lived closer by to me who was like bilingual in a language that I already spoke. I didn't have any attempt to try to like make contact with the community and like ask them if they wanted someone to come in and like do take up all their time and do this. Yeah. And it's not a I'm going to try to figure out some things about my own language as somebody who's potentially from that community trying to interface with the literature. Like, it's got this very colonial, like, I'm going to go off and do some exploring vibes. <laughs> I mean, Quine's thought experiment, he does a very good job of, like, not giving you too much context. And I'm pretty sure he's using the word native in, like, just a general 1960s way where you talk about, like, someone being native in French, but, like, it, it, it that is a, a kind of part of the context that has not aged greatly. And like, ideally, you would be seeing more people documenting their own languages and working with their own communities and not having to do this kind of 
outsider coming in field work. And this very, yeah, this very sort of presumptive field work that you're going to rock up in a village and they're going to have nothing better to do than talk to you. About, yeah, pointing out rabbits. Yeah. Uh, like maybe they've got their own interests and agendas and that's not something that's like on the radar of this. And yet I think that there's still a sort of joy in realizing that we can transcend communication barriers or differences and that despite the many, many cultural differences, can figure out what each other means because we do have some default assumptions. I mean, this is what I love about the Gava Guy moment. And I think this is why I really wanted to see Gav brought to life as a little scurrying bunny, because in that moment in Quine's thought experiment, humans are really good at managing this relationship between ourselves and that humans are actually very good at existing in a shared multilingual world. And we can go from that fragmentary understanding that we all have as kids or that we may have as visitors and people in contact with people that we don't share a language with for so many reasons to making sets of shared assumptions and ultimately getting into the position where we can use our existing language to understand yet more language and deliver those sorts of explanations to each other or have those sorts of arguments about what a tree is or what a fish is or what a fruit is to gain that deeper connection and understanding of the culture and nuances of language in general. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all the podcast platforms at Lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode at Lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including the IPA, branching tree diagrams, Booba and Kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our new Gavagai rabbits on scarves, shirts, and more. Ask me about linguistics as a sticker, a shirt, a pin. And more people have read the text on the shirt than I have, or substitute bag, hat, etc. at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Links to my social media can be found at gretchenmcculloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk to other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include the history of do in English, comparatives and superlatives, and linguistic mix-ups like spoonerisms, mondegreens, and egg corns. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella, our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens, and our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic.